Do you want to know the secrets of the secondhand subculture? Everything about auctions, estate sales, appraisals, and downsizing? What about learning how to make some extra money in the resale world? Well, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to Why Don't You Want My Stuff, the podcast hosted by professional appraiser, auctioneer, and the host of YouTube's Last Week at the Auction, Josh Levine. All right, everybody. Welcome to Why Don't You Want Your Stuff, and I am Josh Levine, and we are going to always discuss everything to do with the secondhand subculture, antiques, collectibles, what's hot, what's not, and why maybe your kids don't want something, the psychology of attachment to items, etc. But I want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, how did I get into this? Um, it's kind of terrifying because I was raised by hoarders. Um, and when I say raised by hoarders, my father was a professional handler and showed dogs like all over the country and world. And my mom tagged along. And when they weren't doing dog shows, they would go to antique stores. And I always like to say they used to have good taste, too. Um, but later in life, when they weren't traveling and going to cool places and getting cool antiques and collectibles, and when they were affordable, like in the 60s and 70s, they uh, discovered QVC, uh, Costco, and the Home Shopping Network, and all sorts of other junk you could buy, and started filling every room of this four-bedroom farmhouse with stuff. Um, my father, I like to say, because he was a child of the Depression, he, uh, you know, is he who dies with you know, he who dies with the most stuff wins. My mom, on the other hand, was classic empty nest. My sister had moved out. Uh, I was in and out of the house most of my teens and playing in rock bands, etc. And uh, I was gone all the time. So she had space that could fill up. And literally, when I was a senior in high school, I came home one day and couldn't get in the front door. Not because I was locked out. I bet you were thinking that. But it was really because my parents had filled the house up with a bunch of junk they had bought at a local farm auction, and it was blocking the door. So I got a ladder and put it up to my second floor window and went in my bedroom that way because my bedroom at that point was kind of off limits for junk, although every once in a while some boxes would creep in there, but I would, I would, I would shove them out in the hallway, which made it difficult to get to the restroom. So I went outside for that too. Anyway, that's kind of there. But when I moved out, oh gosh, and came home when I was about 19, 20, um, not in 1920, about when I was 19 or 20, it was, uh, the house was completely full, like couldn't move. And I had heard stories about people, you know, uh, building themselves out of the house and like living in cars. My parents were pretty darn close to that. Not, but, uh, in a later episode, I will discuss, uh, I did a lot of research on hoarders and there's a scale where they actually psychologists measure hoarders. And my parents were like a 2.5. So apparently five being the worst. So they, they, they were only 2.5. So it wasn't that bad. So anyway, Back to my parents collecting antiques and collectibles. If you would have told me I would have anything to do with them, uh, I would have told you you were nuts. And I probably learned through osmosis of what was worth things or what my parents said were worth things. I also learned, you know, people's attachment to their items. Sometimes, you know, they say what a value is and it's really, that's not the value. That's not where they, so let me get back to it. So how I got into it was I ended up, as I had said, playing in rock bands, you know, which is very profitable, not, especially when you're in doing original music, you know, I'd probably make like 50 bucks a week and, you know, living with six guys and, you know, and apartments and stuff. But let me tell you, it was a lot of fun and going to school, I was going to college and, um, I decided if I could open a music store, I'd be able to get all my stuff wholesale and get stuff from my buddies. So that'd be a cool thing. So I started working at a music store and gave some lessons. And that's really where I started to learn about vintage items because I started to see people collecting uh, vintage musical instruments. And I found it fascinating because I thought the new high tech, you know, guitars were all the rage and, you know, the more effects and everything, you know, that technology was old. Why would anybody want that old school stuff? Well, a lot of the guys who showed me the old school stuff were really ahead of their time. I thought they were nuts. I remember when a guy got excited that somebody brought a Moog synthesizer in and I was like, oh my God, this thing is awful and terrible. And I sold it for like $75 today. That's about 
eight, nine thousand dollars. So I started to see that trend. And as my music store grew, um, I ended up taking over the music store. I started specializing in selling secondhand goods because they were easier to get actually than the dealerships for the, the things everybody wanted. But I found I had the other things people wanted, the weird used, you know, guitars that were crazy looking, odd colors. So I started just getting into the really ugly stuff. And then a friend of mine said something that probably, I don't know if he ever, he probably knows he changed my life in, in uh, a way. He said, have you ever heard of this eBay thing? And this is eBay when it didn't really have too many pictures, you know, like they charge you extra to have a photograph. And uh, he said, you should sell all this used stuff on eBay. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, people really like this stuff. So I put a bunch of things on eBay just to see what would happen. And they sold like instantly because I wasn't asking enough because this was a larger market instead of the small town, you know, Bucks County, Lehigh County, uh, Pennsylvania crowd I had or other musician friends. I had this whole new world that was open to me that would buy, you know, that wanted to buy these vintage things. And all of a sudden, people from New York City were buying things and people from Philadelphia were buying things and they were starting to look for my stuff. So I was like, oh, I'll have a mail order catalog. And I literally made a mail order catalog, like old school mail order catalog that I would mail to people through a mailing list. And but I was selling on eBay and it it was it was fantastic. And people started to bring me things that weren't musical instruments. Like my dad's like, I heard you're selling on that eBay. My, I have friends that are selling on there. Can you sell some things for me? So people started bringing things in and I would charge them a commission. And as the music store started to fail, which is a whole nother story, which we will not get into today, um, having to do with the internet bubble and, and, uh, vendors not wanting me to sell online. They were afraid of the internet. Can you imagine not being allowed to sell musical instruments on the internet? That was a thing in 2001. Um, they, they, I started selling all these antiques and collectibles, and the commissions were, were doing really well. And I was like, I can do this. So if this business fails, I will move into this next venture, which I did. And I started going to yard sales and buying things. I, I, I realized that people wanted the vintage toys I had and they wanted lunch boxes and they were, it was like a whole new world. And it was all the stuff that my dad was dabbling in that all these antique stores, they had drugged me around for years, kids that I would look at this junk sitting on a shelf, like old Tonka trucks. And like, why would somebody want that? Well, they wanted it. And you know what I learned? I learned I never forgot when something was worth money or you could make a buck on it. That I could remember. So all of a sudden, I had this whole new world and this whole new, and I, I was just business opportunity. And I was still playing in bands and doing this stuff. But, you know, to go out yard sailing on a Friday and Saturday and make enough money to support, you know, which now I had a, 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 a family of, of one, a wife, I, I had this time to sell. So that's really how I got into this, and it exploded after that. I mean, I ended up, you know, having employees listing things for me. I started selling, uh, and we'll get into like some of the stories about why I had to get my auctioneer's license. The state of Pennsylvania didn't like people taking consignments and and things like that. So, it's really why I got into this is because I found a way that I could make money doing something that was fun. It was treasure hunting every day. And then I learned I really liked sharing this information with people, you know, out there. And I saw it's a way everyone can make a living. I never got, um, I never got like a competitive about it because guess what? If there's one out there, there's another one. There's, there's a way that everyone can make money in the secondary market. And that's really what I hope this, this podcast ends up doing. It educates you to all the collectibles that are out there, all of the things that people would find interesting. Um, and, and just the weird things people collect, the stuff you threw away. There's going to be things you learn about that, that I tell you, and you're going to say, oh my gosh, we threw that away. Don't cry over spilt milk. Go to, go to Goodwill and find somebody else who threw it away. And you'll find some stuff that you can you know, buy and sell. So that's really why I got into this. I also really like helping people. So the downsizing aspect of it was really good. And I 
probably a psychologist would probably say that's why you help people downsize and get rid of their stuff because your parents were hoarders and you're just trying to help your proverbial parents. And maybe that's true, but we'll find out. So I'm going to briefly go. That's an introduction to me, but I want to briefly go over what's going on in the market right now. And it's funny, we're calling this, you know, why don't you want my stuff? And that really came from a generational thing that a lot of my clients would complain that their kids didn't want what they were they were looking to downsize or get rid of. And I really had to get behind the psychology of that and find out why is that? And it turned out there's a multitude of reasons. One is when the great, and this will, the generational thing, when the greatest generation died with the most, you know, they weren't getting rid of anything. The baby boomer children felt so burdened by this stuff and having to deal with it. And it was emotional and they took off work for months and months and months to downsize their parents and all this. Then coddling their millennial and Gen X children, they didn't want to put them through that. But that was the natural order of things through history. That's how things passed. Someone passes away, you get their things. But now, um, I'm not blaming you, boomers. You wanted to you wanted to not burden your children with that, but you're also wanting your children to take these things on when they're not ready in that point of their life. They're not nostalgic. So the things that were in the family for generations, they're just not, they have, they have a small family. They're, they're not doing, and everybody's doing everything later in life. So, you know, the greatest generation got married at 18 or 22 if they went to college, which was kind of an anomaly. You know, 18 or 22, they had kids that were out of the house or going to college or whatever when they were like 32, 36. And then that's how these things passed. So then they had an empty, they had disposable income in their 40s and they started to collect. The next generation, everything moves back about, you know, you know they went to college, so at 22, they started having families at 26. Their kids weren't leaving the house until they were 55, 60. So now they start that colleges. They're not paying for college anymore. Now they have disposable income in their 60s, not in their 40s. So now they're collecting in their 60s, and now they just got all their parents' stuff. So follow me. They said, here, I don't want grandma's china because I have my own china. I want to give it to my child who goes, I don't care and I don't need China yet. And they're like, well, why don't you want your grandmother's China? It's so, this is a wonderful memory of your family. And they go, I don't have memories of that. It wasn't nostalgic to them. They didn't go to grandma's and have Thanksgiving and, and eat off that China and play with it when they were children. They actually were told when it was at mom's house, don't play with that China. Don't, don't, play in that room because it might get broken. They actually resent those things. And that, think about that. So now I do believe there's going to be a lot of regret 20 years from now with the things you didn't take. And they'll fondly remember and they'll become collectors. They'll go, oh, I remember my mom had one of those or my grandma had one of those. And they'll buy it for nostalgia. And that's the thing that's missing. And it missed. And this happens a lot. This happened in the 1920s, the roaring 20s. Everybody wanted deco and new and sleek lines and clean. Victorian was out. And nobody wanted it. But then in the 50s, that formality of the big Thanksgiving, the Norman Rockwell crept back in and people were fascinated with that stuff. But then in the 60s, the mid-century modern, what came back? Slick lines, sleek that's what happens. So if you look at it that way, what's hot and what's not, it makes a lot of sense. It really does. So that's what I really try to do when I'm talking with clients about who are downsizing and why certain things are worth money and certain things are not. Uh, and it then makes sense to them, you know, because one of the things we battle in the second hair world is people's attachment to things they own or from their family or their provenance. They feel like, you know, my great grandfather, who was a great man because he was the first guy at IBM to use a pencil sharpener. And they feel that anything then he owned because of this strange fact gives it like Neil Armstrong provenance. And they're like, and you're like, I don't know your grandfather. Wikipedia doesn't know who your grandfather is. So that provenance isn't really helping the item. The item is the item. And oh, by the way, 1,700 other 
grandpa's stuff just like yours is currently available on the market. So supply and demand, there's a huge supply. You're selling your heirloom. You don't want it anymore. There's the demand. So no demand, large supply. That's why prices on antiques and collectibles had slid. That all said, you know, when I, there's a book I wrote also called, uh, you know, why don't you want my stuff, which gets into a lot of this stuff. And what's funny though, is I'm starting to see what I talked about five years ago. And that is a trend going the other direction. People are getting nostalgic. People are collecting. And I'm actually, I believe people are going to be divided. You know, we're so divisive in this country. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but we're very divisive. And we're, there's going to be two people. There's going to be analog people and digital people. And analog people are going to want the analog stuff, the real antiques and collectibles you can put your hands on. And then there's going to be people that are going to accept the digital currency version, the NFTs and all that. That's going to be a show too. I'm going to need a guest for that. Otherwise, I will ramble like I'm rambling today. But I think that'll be a really interesting topic, and I can't wait to hear everybody else's thoughts on that when I get into augmented reality antiques. That'll be a whole show onto itself. That'll be interesting to me, so I hope interesting to you. Oh, I'm trying to think where else I want to go with this. I think that's a great introduction to uh, Josh at Josh Levine Speaks forward slash Why Don't You Want My Stuff podcast hyperventilation number six. That's what that episode's called. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Oh, I'm every week I'm going to bring you a strange collectible of the week. And do I want to call it that? I don't know if I want to call it weird collectible of the week. No, strange collectible of the week. Vince likes that better. Strange collectible of the week. This week is going to be, let me pull something from my data banks. Oh, I'm going to use it. Firecracker labels. Firecracker labels are extremely collectible. What? Yes. A few years back, I had a friend bring me a collection of firecrackers, and I mean lady fingers and black cats and things like that that you might remember someone having. I don't know. I, I'm always surprised they sell firecrackers here in uh, uh, Phoenix, which I think is insane. But whatever the case, you know, there's not a drought or anything. But firecracker labels and the art on those labels the vintage labels from the 50s and 60s are highly collectible so when a gentleman paid five thousand dollars for one of the firecracker packages i was selling for a client and i asked him why on earth would you pay five thousand dollars for this dumb thing to ask somebody that just spent five thousand dollars especially before he paid you but he said look at their art they're beautiful and i said okay i get it and he goes think of it like a baseball card i'm like okay i get it he goes now think about their rarity and i'm like okay and i said what do you mean he said well when people got one of these packs of firecrackers they lit the the side it pop 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 pop, and the paper blew down the street they didn't keep these labels so they're extremely rare and i was like wow and then immediately i went to Who's uh, who's pirating these things and making uh, fakes already? But I digress. They are beautiful. There are coffee table books dedicated to them. So if you're cleaning out grandpa's drawer, or your uncle's you know cabin, and, and you find some old firecrackers in a dresser drawer, have those looked at. Bet you would have thrown them away. That's my strange collectible of the week. Not my weird one. Right, Vince? Right. All right. Thank you. That's podcast. Thank you for listening to Why Don't You Want My Stuff with Josh Levine. If you're interested in learning more or becoming an expert, please follow and support the show by rating us on your favorite podcast player. Engage with us. If you have ideas or questions, send an email to josh at joshlevinespeaks.com or you can visit www.joshlevinespeaks.com. We'd love to talk about your question on the show. This has been a T-Door production. Music by RKVC.